It's being called the toughest division in baseball. All five teams over 500. All five teams fighting for the playoffs. And the team in first place now? Well, that's the Baltimore Orioles. We'll talk about that coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, July 20th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the Orioles' 8-5 to win over the Los Angeles Dodgers as they once again avoided a sweep and have claimed first place in the American League East. That's right. They have caught the Rays, the team that started 13-0. and And the O's hold down first place, heading into an incredibly important series at the Trop this weekend. But I'll get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' win over L.A., including a huge outing from Danny Coulomb, Dean Kramer having some struggles against his former team, and Ramon Arias coming up with the clutch hits. Then we will recap Tuesday night's loss to the Dodgers with no episode on Wednesday and quickly touch on some of the points from that one before getting to some Orioles news and notes at the end of the show. Cedric Mullins is back on the injured list. CNL Perez is off the IL and the Orioles announced a bunch of draft pick signings. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast. Before we get there, though, just did want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms. We're also right here on YouTube. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. And thank you all for being patient with me out there again, as you probably noticed. No episode on Wednesday. Now, I'm sure you all didn't want an episode completely dedicated to Maybe the Orioles' ugliest loss of the season that came to the Dodgers on Tuesday. We're still going to talk about it on today's episode, but some things came up outside the podcast world. Just wasn't able to record for Wednesday's episode, but back here on Thursday, which a much happier episode coming to you here anyway. So thank you again for being patient, sticking with me, being an everyday or making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. For your first listen today, let's start with an Orioles win. Final score from Oriole Park at Camden Yards on Wednesday afternoon. Orioles 8 and the Los Angeles Dodgers 5 as the O's avoid the sweep after dropping the first two games of the series. Get out of here with a win and start the second half with a winning homestand at 4-2. and two. With the W, the O's snap the quick little two-game skid and get to 58-37 and 37 on the season. And with the Rays 5-1 to one loss to the Rangers on Wednesday, which means the Rays were swept in Texas this week, the Orioles, that's right, the Baltimore Orioles on July 19th took over first place in the American League East. Now, there's still a lot of baseball to play this season, but the O's are in first. And after the Rays started this year 13-0, and they were, what, 27-6, and I believe, at one point this season? I don't think anybody thought. I didn't think anybody was going to catch the Rays, let alone the Orioles. But in terms of percentage points, the Orioles are ahead of the Rays. They are currently tied atop the standings, but the Orioles at 58 and 37 have a 611 winning percentage. The Rays at 60 and 39, they've played four more games, have a 606 winning percentage. And with the new rules from the new CBA, they are no longer any tiebreaker games, no more game 163s. So if you finish tied either in the division or in a wild card spot, it goes to the head-to-head record. And because the Orioles are 3-2 and two against the Rays so far this season, they are in first place. And technically, if the season ended right now, the O's would be your AL East division champions. So let's talk about it. And plus, they avoided the sweep, right? They still haven't been swept this year. They still haven't been swept since Adley Rutschman was called up last May. That is 70 consecutive series without being swept for the Orioles. That is an unbelievable number. But I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the 8-5 to five win that avoided the sweep and put the Orioles in first place. And the first thing you need to know from this one is Ramon Arias came through with the big hits for the Orioles in this game. Started in the first inning after the O's had tied the game at two. Arias coming through with a huge two-run double. And all of a sudden, 
The Orioles, after giving up two in the top of the first, took a 4-2 to two lead in the bottom half. That was really huge for this O's team. After they had given up runs early on Tuesday night and fell behind quickly to go down 2 nothing and immediately put up the four spot, that's what this O's team has been known to do. Gave them their 34th comeback win of the season. It was a double off the bat of Arias to right field where Gunnar Henderson was flying around the bases and barely with a great slide scored from first to make it 4-2. to two. And then Arias did it again, an RBI double in the third inning. This one kind of looped down the left field line to make it a 5-2 to two game. He would also walk later in the eighth. So it was a nice little two for three for Arias reaching base three times on the day out of the seven hole. Just provided a really big boost with those three RBIs for the Orioles and made a couple of nice defensive plays in the game as well. Second thing you need to know from this one, maybe the unsung hero of the Orioles season was certainly the unsung hero of Wednesday's win. That is Danny Coulomb, who Brandon Hyde said after the game, that was his best performance of the season. And I don't think you can argue it. Coulomb, who came in to relieve Dean Kramer with two outs in the fifth inning, ends up going two and a third scoreless, allowing just one hit with three strikeouts and no walks, only through 25 pitches to get those two and a third scoreless innings. No hard hit balls, lowered his ERA to 2.70 on the year. It was a season high for Coulomb, the two and a third innings. He's rarely done that in his career. And it was six whiffs on 11 swings. The stuff was great. He was getting swings and misses with the fastball, which was really interesting for him. The sinker-cutter combination had five of his six whiffs. Didn't really throw many breaking balls. 20 of his 25 pitches were sinkers and really kind of that cutter-slash-slider hybrid. Kind of liked what I saw from Danny Coulomb. I mean, it was absolute dominance. He came in, you know, with a tying run on in a five to or seven to five game in the fifth and got the Orioles all the way to Cano and Bautista in the eighth and ninth. What a job by him. Third thing you need to know from this one is the reason Danny Coulomb had to enter in this fifth inning and the reason why he had to kind of be the hero out of the bullpen is because it was a rough start for Dean Kramer. Getting to face his old team for the first time, of course, Kramer coming over from the Dodgers in the Manny Machado trade all the way back in 2018, the only one of those five players that came over that is still with the Orioles. He got a chance, a little revenge, and didn't really grab it by the horns in Wednesday start. Kramer not even able to complete five innings in this game, goes four and two-thirds, allowing five runs on four hits, here was the big issue. He walked four batters and only struck out one in this game while allowing two home runs. Took him 91 pitches. The Dodgers were really all over him. Eight hard hit balls in four and two thirds innings. Now, Kramer has had a couple of rough starts this year, so it's not super easy to just say, you know, by far this was his worst start of the season. I mean, remember, he did give up seven runs in three innings against the Twins just a couple of weeks ago. But in terms of the walks, I mean, Kramer had only walked three batters once this year. That was all the way back in his second start of the year against the Yankees. Every other start had been 0-1 or two walks. So to walk a season-high four batters, strike out a season-low one batter in this one, it was kind of close to his worst start of the year. I did not like how the stuff looked at all for Dean Kramer. He did give up two in the first and then seemed to slightly settle down, give up a couple more homers later in the game, including the two-run shot to Max Muncy. That basically bounced him out of the game in the fifth inning. Just wasn't impressed with Kramer stuff. Four whiffs on 40 swings is not a good number at all. The O's can't be having this, these kind of starts from Dean Kramer. And his last two starts have been really, really good. So we'll give him a pass on this one. But if the O's do go acquire a starter, it kind of feels like Kramer would be the first one to move to the bullpen. So he's got to start to pick things up if he wants to stay in that starting role and at least get a little more consistent for the Orioles. Fourth thing you need to know from this one, I mentioned Ramon Arias having the big three RBI day. He was really part of the bottom of this Orioles order that got things done in this one. Now, the O's didn't have Cedric Mullins, who was placed on the injured list. We'll talk about that in a bit. They didn't have Adley Rutschman, who got a full day off. The lineup did look a little different in this one. And it was not just the bottom half, but basically the guys below the top three who got things done. It was another two-hit day for Aaron Hicks, who had an RBI Jordan Westberg had a nice day with a two for four, a double, and an RBI. Gunnar Henderson hit his first homer off a lefty in this game, taking Julio Arias deep in the fifth inning to put the Orioles up eight to five, just sat on a hanging slider and hit it out of here. He had a walk as well. 
I mentioned Arias, even James McCann, a one for four with a double, and Jorge Mateo ended up creating a run in this game in the fourth inning when he doubled, stole third, and then scored on an Austin Hayes sack fly. Everybody was kind of getting things done. Mateo continued to show that he can hit lefties. I mean, the Orioles just bludgeoned Julio Arias, who they got him for eight runs on eight hits in five innings. He now has a five-plus ERA. I don't know what happened to him, but he's been terrible this season, and the O's made the most of it to help and avoid this sweep. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from this one is the back end of the bullpen did its job. I mean, the biggest shout out goes to Danny Coulomb for those two and a third scoreless, but Yenny Cano gave up a leadoff single, but got a double play and a strikeout. And then Felix Bautista did give up a two out single, the first base runner he's allowed since the all-star break, but puts up a zero to lock down the save and gives the Orioles an eight to five win. They avoid the sweep. And again, with the Rays loss to the Rangers, the Orioles jump into first place in the American League East. But the reason why, you know, the Orioles had to win this one to avoid the sweep is because, well, they lost in pretty crushing fashion, the Chris Taylor Grand Slam on Monday, and then kind of lost in embarrassing fashion, 10-3 to on Tuesday night. And as I mentioned, no episode Wednesday, so wasn't able to recap that game. Don't want to talk about it too, too much because it was kind of a painful game and we've got another win to talk about now, but did want to recap briefly game two of this series from Tuesday night and get you the five things you need to know from that one. That's coming up right after this. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. And it's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. So just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. So the Orioles were able to take down the Dodgers 8-5 to on Wednesday to avoid that sweep, get into first place, and we got to talk about it, right? Like the O's are now playing one of the biggest series of the year. Four games coming up in Tampa Bay against the Rays starting tonight. The two teams tied atop the division. All eyes in Major League Baseball will be on Orioles Rays at the Trop. And it all starts tonight, Thursday night, July 20th, a 6.40 p.m. Eastern time start. Tyler Glass now goes for the Rays. He is back from the multitude of injuries he has suffered over the past couple of years. The 29-year-old righty, a 3.78 ERA in nine starts this season. But he's got 71 strikeouts in 48 innings. That is kind of absurd. Coming off his last start, which was really, really good against the Royals, six innings, one run, and seven strikeouts for Tyler Glass now in that one. Now, the Orioles have faced him one time this year, and by and large, it was Glass now's worst start. Honestly, by far his worst start of the year. He faced the O's the Trop on June 20th exactly a month ago, four and a third innings, six runs, six hits. Two homers, seven Ks, and two walks. O's would love to do that to Glass now again tonight. And on the other side, it's the veteran righty, Kyle Gibson, who goes for the Orioles. And Gibby is just going to have to get out of this rut he is in. Now, he's eating innings, 115 of them this year in 20 starts. But the ERA has ballooned to 477. Gave up five runs on nine hits with just one strikeout in that last start against the Miami Marlins over five and a third innings. O's will need him to be better at the trop. If they want to kick off this series and get a firm, firm one-game lead in the AL East. Gibson has faced Tampa once already this year. It was back on May 8th in Baltimore. He was good. Six innings, two runs, six hits, four Ks, and two walks. Those will gladly take one of those again tonight. And you can listen to every single pitch of the Orioles' hometown radio broadcast of Game 1 between the Orioles and Rays with the SXM app through SiriusXM. Just download the app and search Orioles. But you also could have listened to every pitch of Tuesday night's game and Wednesday night's game. Now, I would encourage you to listen to Wednesday's game. 
I wouldn't encourage you to use the app to go back and listen to Tuesday night's game because it was a rough one. It was a 10-3 to loss for the Orioles that dropped them to 0-2 in the series and forced them to have to win Wednesday, which they did to once again avoid a sweep. But because, as I mentioned, I didn't have an episode Wednesday, wasn't able to recap Tuesday's game, wanted to quickly do it here and get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 10-3 to loss to the Dodgers on Tuesday night. Now, I was in the ballpark, had some good seats, had a great time, except for what was going on on the field. And the first thing you need to know is, by far, I mean, this is honestly not even close. Tyler Wells had objectively his worst start of the season. And honestly, one of his worst starts in an Orioles uniform since the O's moved him to the rotation last season. Wells lasted just two innings, allowing five runs on six hits. He struck out two, he walked two, he allowed a homer, threw 59 pitches, and it jumped his ERA to 3.54, four hard hit balls against him in the two innings. And it was interesting because I was honestly impressed with Tyler Wells' first in, in this game. He came out there, struck out Mookie Betts to start the game. Then after a Freddie Freeman kind of bloop single, he gets Will Smith, and then he strikes out Max Muncie looking, and you're like, all right, great start. O's go down one, two, three. Wells comes back out there. He walks J.D. Martinez. David Peralta gets a single. And then Jason Hayward gets a meaty pitch and hits a three-run homer. And all of a sudden, things start going downhill. Then a walk, then a single, then a couple more hits, and all of a sudden it's 5 nothing. And Wells did end the second inning at 5 nothing, but that was it for him. I, I don't know. I, I just kind of consider this a blip on the radar. Like, I don't really worry about Wells. Like, yeah, I don't love three whiffs on 26 swings and 59 pitches overall. And, you know, I don't love five runs in two innings. But Tyler Wells has just been so good and so consistent this year. I mean, he had gone at least five innings in every single start until this one when he goes two. And he had been the Orioles by far most consistent starter. You know, as one of the lowest whips in all of Major League Baseball. That three-run homer that he allowed to Jason Hayward in the second inning, yeah, he's allowed a lot of homers this year. But that three-run shot was the first homer he had allowed that wasn't a solo shot or a two-run homer because he just doesn't allow a lot of base runners. So. I think you give him some leeway. You give him some grace. I mean, you look at what he has done. He had given up exactly two earned runs in his last seven starts coming into this one, and then he gives up five in two innings. Yeah, just consistency across the board and just a little blip on the radar, I think. I, I'm not worried. I think he'll go back out there his very next start. He's going to face the Rays. Huge chance this weekend on Sunday to maybe finish out a series win for the O's. And I think he'll be right back on track. Second thing you need to know from the 10 to 3 loss on Tuesday is that Cole Irvin, who replaced Wells, took over in the third inning, really did save the bullpen. It was the first time Irvin had pitched since being moved back to the pen when the Orioles recalled Grayson Rodriguez to rejoin the rotation on Monday night. And Irvin was good. Four innings, two runs on four hits with four Ks and three walks. The line doesn't even tell how good he was. Those two runs came around to score in the seventh inning when the Dodgers got four runs and just an ugly inning for the O's. But Irvin threw four scoreless in the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, including the fact that he somehow, some way, was able to tightrope his way out of a pretty big, I would say, jam that he got himself into in that sixth inning, bases loaded and no outs, and somehow snuck out of it to keep it a 5-1 game, really kept the O's in the game for a while there. Yeah, he kind of just ran out of gas. You know, he threw 80 pitches, so he kind of ran out of it a little bit in that fifth inning of work. But that was huge to save the Orioles' pen. Third thing you need to know from the Tuesday night loss is that the Orioles actually did hit the ball hard in this game. Like, yeah, they only scored three runs, but they did have nine hits, and they squared it up throughout the night. I mean, the Orioles against Michael Grove, who has a 6.4 ERA and gave up just one run on five hits over five innings with four Ks and two walks, it wasn't for the Orioles' lack of trying. They had 10 hard-hit balls against Grove in those five innings. I mean, Jordan Westberg had a two-for-four with four hard-hit balls. Adley had a one-for-five with three hard-hit balls. Santander and Aaron Hicks each had a couple of lasers in this game, and they just weren't really rewarded. The nine hits just did not show, and even some of those balls didn't turn into hits when they should have. So, yeah, it wasn't the best offensive performance. Much more worried about the pitching and defense from this game, but I thought the offense just got a little unlucky in the loss on Tuesday. 
Fourth thing you need to know from this one, speaking of pitching and defense, the defense just completely let the Orioles down in Tuesday night's loss. Four errors committed by the O's defense was the most of the season. And just the 13th time this century that the Orioles had committed four or more errors in one game. Think about that. The Orioles have played a lot of bad baseball since 2000. Only the 13th time they've done that. It's pretty surprising. Adley had an error. You know, they had some throwing errors. Gunner had some. O'Hearn had some bad ones. It was it was not good. Adam Frazier had a really bad one. We should have turned an easy double play and said booted it for zero outs. I mean, he's had a weird year where he came in and, and should have been kind of a solid defensive second baseman like he's been his whole career. And he's been one of the worst defensive second basemen in all of baseball this year. Just fell off a cliff defensively. Not sure what's really happening there. But yeah, that's a flush it defensive game. You do not want to go back and watch the highlights of that one. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 10-3 loss to the Dodgers on Tuesday night is that, well, Mike Bauman pitched two really strong innings. He finished this game off out of the bullpen, replacing CNL Perez, threw two scoreless. The one run was unearned because of the errors, but two hits, four Ks, no walks, 28 pitches. But after Bauman threw the eighth inning and gave up the unearned run, I thought, well, the Orioles probably aren't going to throw Mike Bauman for a second inning to make him unavailable for Wednesday you know, they're down 10 to 1. They'll probably throw a position player. And, and that's what I thought would happen. And I think that's what everyone in the stadium thought was going to happen. Because you look down at the bullpen, nobody was warming up for the O's. You thought they're not going to burn Bauman completely in this game. He's too important to the bullpen. So they'll probably go to a position player. But then the Orioles rallied a little bit in the bottom of the eighth inning. Santander doubles, O'Hearn singles, Aaron Hicks drives in a run. All of a sudden, the O's score two runs and it's 10 to 3. And you're thinking, well, you're still down 7 you're still going to put in a position player. Well, actually, you can't do it anymore because per the new rules for this year, you have to be down by eight runs or more to use a position player as a pitcher. And well, because the O's scored two in the bottom of the eighth, they went down by seven. And so Brandon Hyde, because he wasn't going to have anyone warm up because he was planning on a position player, had to throw Bauman back out there. And luckily, Bauman actually struck out the side in the top of the ninth, made quick work of it. But it was kind of a weird thing where the O's were ready. I was interested to see who was going to throw because Ryan McKenna has been that guy this year, but he's currently not on the roster. He's back in AAA. I, I stayed in the park because I wanted to see who was going to throw and then realized, oh, wait, they scored too many runs, couldn't do it. It's kind of a weird quirk of baseball in 2023. But the O's did lose an ugly game 10-3 to on Tuesday. Luckily, as we talked about, though, they bounced back, win it 8-5 to Wednesday, and avoid the sweep. But did have a few more things to talk about here on today's episode having to do with some news and notes for the Orioles, some draft pick signings, some injured list and roster moves, and some guys maybe, maybe starting to make their way back from injury. That's coming up next. So for the Orioles, have had some news and notes come out over the past couple of days. Just wanted to recap all of that. Before we get to the end of this episode here today, let's start with the MLB draft. We know the Orioles had signed their first two picks, Enrique Bradfield Jr. and Mac Horvath. They were both uh, introduced to the Camden Yards crowd, specifically Bradfield, earlier this week. And we also knew they had signed their 20th round pick as well. But besides that, we hadn't heard much about the O's signings. Well, they announced a large crop of them during Wednesday's game. And now 17 of their 22 draft picks have been signed. So the question is, who are the five who are still unsigned? We've got five days until the jet deadline. July 25th is the deadline to sign your draft picks. Let's start with the ones who have already basically said, yeah, they're not coming to the Orioles. Tanner Witt, the starter coming off Tommy John, who the Orioles took out of Texas in the 18th round, basically 24 hours after the draft, he posted on Twitter, he's going back to Texas. I think everyone pretty much assumed that. Colin Ritchie, the 19th round pick out of high school who will go to Oklahoma for college. He still hasn't announced officially that he's going to Oklahoma, but he seemed like a really tough guy to sign. Still a possibility, but we will see. O's are going to need to throw some more money there. And then Q. Ray Lott, the 15th round outfielder that the Orioles took out of high school, he announced on Tuesday that he is going to junior college. He'll probably try to play one year of JUCO and then get drafted again. Then you have the two others that are even more interesting. Michael Ferret is the first one, right-handed pitcher out of the 14th round that the Orioles took out of junior college. Now, Ferret was a guy who was really good in high school, was committed to ECU, East Carolina, a great baseball program, but decided, I don't want to do that. Went to junior college instead because you can go to a JUCO for one year and then still get drafted after one season. Gets picked in the 14th round, but 
it seems like because he was picked later, he has a little leverage. You know, he could go back to school. He could go back to his junior college. He could transfer potentially, go to a Division I school. He certainly got the talent as a right-handed pitcher. So he's got some options. That means he can ask for a little more money from the Orioles, and that is probably why they haven't signed him yet. But the one that's still a little iffy and the O's need to sign is Jackson Baumeister, their third overall pick in the draft, competitive balance B-round, earliest pitcher Mike Elias has ever taken out of Florida State. We talked with Brett Nevitt last week on the pod about Baumeister, and it said, you know, Baumeister might take a little bit of extra money to sign. That seems to be what's happening. His slot value is $1.24 million, And the fact that he wasn't announced with these other guys tells me specifically that he is asking for an overslot deal. Now, it's something the Orioles can do. They did go exact slot value with their first round pick, Enrique Bradfield. But a lot of their other day two picks went under slot. And even Matt Horvath went a little bit under slot. So with all of their deals that have been slightly under slot so far, the Orioles have saved about $375,000 at this point out of the about $11.1 million that they have in their draft pool for 2023. So in theory, they could allocate all of that, about $375,000 to Jackson Baumeister and get him up from the $1.24 million slot value and could get him closer to about $1.6 million in his deal. And hopefully that is enough to get him to the Orioles and keep him from going back to Florida State. He could go back. He's only pitched two years. He could go back, pitch better, and be a first-round pick next year. So he does have some leverage here. But with as high as the O's drafted him and as much as they love him, they're going to do whatever it takes to get him. And I think it's only a matter of time before they do sign Jackson Baumeister. Again, they can even go 5% over the $11.1 million draft pool with minimal penalties. So we could see them do that just to make sure that Baumeister signs with the Orioles. Now, from the draft back to the major league level, did have a couple of roster moves to quickly break down that the O's made earlier this week. The first one came before Tuesday's game as CNL Perez, who was on the IL for basically the 15 days with a little elbow issue. He pitched a really good outing on rehab in Bowie over the weekend, and the Orioles decided to activate him on Tuesday. Now, unfortunately, when they did that, they did have to option Nick Vespi down to AAA. Vespi had just thrown two and a third scoreless out of the pen on Monday. He wasn't going to be available for a couple of days. He has a lot of options left, and he's kind of just in option purgatory right now with the Orioles. He's on the Norfolk shuttle. He was on it all of last year. That was his third option of the season. You have a maximum of five before you have to put a player on waivers. So expect Vespi to come up and probably be optioned again at some point this year. He's good. He's just not good enough to stick in the bullpen every single day, at least the stuff-wise. And the O's, you know, they they really got to make a decision coming up soon on CNL Perez and wanted to get him back to get a look. Now, Perez didn't look so great. Gave up two runs. Defense didn't help him out, though, when he pitched on Tuesday night. But it's frustrating for Vespi and for some O's fans, but I get why they made the move that they did. And then before Wednesday's game, a much more unfortunate move was made. Now, Logan Gillespie came back up for another stint with the Orioles. He'll kind of be like the emergency guy in the bullpen for a bit, the you know eighth and final man. But the Orioles did finally go back to the even 13 pitchers and 13 hitters on Wednesday because they finally decided they had to place Cedric Mullins back on the 10-day injured list. Now, Mullins, who kind of injured himself in the game on Saturday night, came up awkwardly when he was running to third on what ended up being a foul ball in the second inning, had to leave the game. Initially, the Orioles called it a little bit of a quad issue, which was different from the kind of adductor slash groin strain that kept Mullins out for about a month earlier this year. He tried to hit. He took BP. He wasn't really running much. And the Orioles finally decided on Wednesday, we can't go a man down for this long. Let's put him on the injured list. Now, the IL stint for 10 days is retroactive to July 16th. So technically, if he just needs a little more rest, he could come back on the 26th, so next Wednesday. So it wouldn't be too long until he comes back. But the concerning part is how they announced the injury, because the O's said when he went out, it was a quad issue, which would be different from the initial injury. But the official roster move said right groin strain, which is the exact same injury that put him on the IL the first time. And that is concerning because he heard it running again. It's the same injury again. And I hope a re-injury for Mullins doesn't mean a longer term issue. I would love if it's just something minor. He's back in the 10 days. But there's a chance this could be that same three to four weeks that it took the last time. If that is the chance, and that's what happens, 
We're going to see a lot of Aaron Hicks again. We'll see more Colton Kowser because he's here. You have Hayes and Santander in the outfield. But Ryan Mountcastle is going to stay for now because Mullins is on the IL and the O's back to 13 and 13. We'll discuss more about you know what they do without Mullins this time around as more info comes out about how severe the injury is this time. But the O's, they're 42 and 22 with Mullins in the lineup, 16 and 15 with him out of the lineup. Even though they did weather the storm without him last time, it is hard to play without a player who has been this impactful for the Orioles. And the last thing, some good news. John Means threw a bullpen on Tuesday, and he threw change-ups. It's good to see. He is apparently targeting an early September return. Don't put too many of your eggs in the John Means basket. He could be back to his regular John Means by the end of the season, but he's coming off Tommy John, then he had a little setback with a back issue. I don't even know if he can rejoin the rotation when he comes back. I mean, he'll probably come back and join the bullpen for a bit in September. Yeah, he can help the O's get to the playoffs, and yeah, he can help the O's in the playoffs, but just do not expect John Means to come back and be the O's number one starter. It's just not going to happen. It could happen in 2024. I just don't think it's going to happen this year with all that injury time. Missed. He'll help the O's, and he'll be back, but he's just not going to be the John Means we know probably until next season. And I guess one more thing I got to get to. We'll leave it more for next week as more comes out, but City officials, story came out, Baltimore Sun and the Baltimore Banner on Wednesday. City officials are angry with the Orioles. They're basically saying they're dragging their feet. They are not getting the new lease done in a timely manner. And who does that fall on? Of course, John Angelos. John, wake up, get it done. That's all I got to say there. But the O's avoid the sweep. They're in first place. And it's O's and Rays starting tonight. Four-game series cannot wait. The two teams tied for first to face off four games this weekend. And I'll be back tomorrow recapping game one between the Orioles and the Rays. And we'll talk a little trade deadline because it's sneaking up on us, right? I mean, less than two weeks away. Start to maybe preview what the O's could do at that deadline to improve the team. That's coming up on tomorrow's episode. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.